Uh, good morning, everyone. So thank you all for being here. Uh, our pre presentation is called Under Protection Transcends Boundaries. My name is Kendall Clark, and I kind of have a loud voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Denitra Sherman. Yeah, and we're with Girls Justice League, and Girls Justice League is a girls' rights organization in Philadelphia. We focus on social, political, uh, economic, reproductive uh, justice. And so we're here today to uh, present uh, some work that we've done. All right, so before we get started, we kind of just wanted to go a little bit over the agenda. Um, it was kind of nice that we, well, it was kind of nice and scary that we were going first. Um, but we were like, oh, then this would be awesome to kind of just like set the stage for today. Um, so we're going to have a quick introduction. We're going to have the status of girls and women, just a couple of facts and statistics. Um, we're going to have a narrative to share with you all. Um, we're going to have a piece about why we can't wait. We're going to have a nice video um, just to kind of show you all what we have been doing in Philadelphia. And then we're also going to have a space for reflection and discussion, questions and answers. Um, but we really want this to be a nice conversation with our homegirls. So, you know, if any moment you have a question or we may say something that you're like, wait a minute, what they say? Feel free to stop us. So last December, Girls Justice League, along with eight local nonprofits and the African American Policy Forum, hosted a town hall with uh, focusing on and with girls and women of color. And we really highlighted three main areas, gender-based violence, uh, school climate, and juvenile justice. I mean, so our presentation won't necessarily focus on the town hall, but we really want to highlight the power in centering girls and women of color, but also the work that comes out of, of, of centering girls and women of color. So when it comes to the status of girls and women, I feel like we could probably be up here all night, a couple days, weeks, years, just kind of talking about what's going on. Um, but we really want to just to kind of like highlight some statistics that we've come across just to kind of see like what is going on. Um, so when we think about the violence against women, um, approximately 35% of women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence um, or sexual violence by a non-partner at some point in their lives. So we look at this big picture like, oh, like that's 35%. And then just kind of thinking at the national level and thinking about various studies that have been conducted, studies have shown that there's 70%, up to 70% of women actually have experienced physical or sexual abuse or violence from a partner. Um, then we kind of think about systemic oppression. I mean, oppression manifests itself in so many various systems, whether it's like when it comes to education, when it comes to work, but we just kind of wanted to paint a nice little picture. Um, there's an evident part, a pattern of racial disparity in the distribution of punitive discipline against black students. When we look at the school system and just kind of like looking at some of the facts from the U.S. Department of Education, when it comes to girls of color, they're six times more likely to be six, uh, suspended from school compared to their white counterparts. When we go to look at the school to prison pipeline, black girls are the fastest growing population in the juvenile justice system. In Philadelphia alone, one in five high school students have been involved with child welfare or the juvenile system. And when we think about reporting rates, especially in Philadelphia, black girls are actually 30% more likely to be reported um, to the juvenile system or the child welfare system. So when we think about all the data and the numbers, we're like, okay, that's nice. We have this mental picture, we see the numbers. But it's very important to really know, like how are women and girls truly being impacted? What are they experiencing on a daily basis? And we feel that when it comes to this, it's very important to kind of have stories to really show and depict what's going on. And when we think about a lot of the advocacy work that we do or activism, it's really important to have two pieces. I like to call it the brain and the heart. So we have this strategy, we have a plan of action. That's great, but if people can't understand why you are truly inspired and moved to do what you, you know, the work that you're doing, you're not gonna be able to mobilize people. And with stories, we're able to kind of bring it all together and really show people like, this is what the hell is going on and we need to make a difference. Um, so, and going back to the town hall that we had in Philadelphia, um, we wanted to pull in the stories and uplift voices of the girls and women in the community. And so today I'm going to share with you a story um, of one of the young women that we came across. Um, we wanted her to do a video, but she still is getting comfortable with sharing her story. Um, so I'm going to read it as if I was her. Um, I am going to change her name, um, but I think this is a very powerful story, and it just kind of shows like all the different pieces that come into place in the lives of women and girls.
And I will just warn people, every time I like hear this story or do this story, it always kind of gets me choked up. So just bear with me, but I'm gonna try to go through this with, the, um, with this one. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Matilda. I'm originally from Liberia in West Africa. A little over 10 years ago, while I was still in Liberia, I remember one day very clearly. I was coming from school very hungry, no food at home, and my mother had gone out to sell some commodities for us to feed. I decided to go to the corner store down, by, down the street from where we used to live. When I got there, I didn't have money to buy anything, and I asked the store man if he could credit me with some bread, and when my mother returned home from selling, I was going to pay him back. The store man said no to me because he was not sure of me paying him back. A man had walked into the store and he heard me asking for credit. He asked me if I was hungry and I said, yes, sir. I was still in my school uniform, so he asked me, are you from school? I replied, yes, sir. He also asked me, where do you live? Where are your parents? I also answered, sir, I live down the street from here. My father was killed during the Civil War, and my mother had gone out to sell some commodities. He immediately told me, in a kind and sad tone, that he wished he could help me if he had some cash, but I could follow him to his home for him to get cash. Upon our arrival to his house, he called me into this room. But at first, I refused to enter because I remember my mother had advised me not to enter any man's room. Well, he encouraged me, and he made me to believe him that he wouldn't do anything harmful to me. I just was kept thinking to myself, I'm really hungry, so I went in. When I entered into the room, I saw two other guys sitting, and I was immediately pushed to the ground. He forced my clothes off, and they all took turns raping me, one by one. I did not have any energy or force to fight them off, they used me. I started bleeding. It was so painful, I could not stand up. I lied there for about hours, four hours to be exact, and I did not know where I was. After I managed to walk home, I showered, I trashed the bloody cloths because I did not want my mother to know about it. Why? I knew she would be upset because she had already told me to never go into a man's house. She would have asked me, why did you go there? I didn't advise you to go into any man's room. Since I did not have the answers to her questions, I decided to stay silent. I endured the immediate physical and mental trauma of it. School was not an option for me. I abandoned school. However, I left home every single day dressed in my uniform as if I was going to school so that my mother would not know that anything was going on. One month later, when I was feeling much better, I ran away from home. I suffered feelings of guilt, fear of facing the blame in my community or my family, so I did not report it. And unfortunately, so many other girls and women do the same. When it comes to the person in this story, um, she just kind of summarized it all, but even in between time of her being raped and her running away from home, she actually tried to commit suicide on several occasions. Uh, one time she actually tried to overdose on pill medications and just thought that she would just go to sleep and it would all just go away, um, but it didn't work. And as I tell her every day, it was a blessing. It was a reason for her to be here and for her to share a voice and share her story to everyone. And just kind of thinking about this story and what happened to her, even though it happened in, it happened in Liberia, this story, this is, th these are things that happen to our girls and women every single day here in the States. It's not just a United States thing, a regional thing. It's, it happens all over. And I'm just very grateful for her to be able to let us share her story, just for us to be able to paint a picture that we, there's so much work for us to do and that we really need to make sure that we are advocating and being a voice for women like her. So with that, uh, having all of these stories from 
Matilda, but also from Philly natives, uh, we really thought about who should be in the room uh, when telling these stories. How can we hold our school and political leaders accountable? Uh, Philly is definitely a very uh, MBK city, so they're, they, they're interested or they're willing to do racial justice work, um, but we have yet to see intersectional justice work. Uh, so in doing the town hall, uh, we thought about how can we bring in different folks um, so we had a variety of different um, nonprofits uh, and foundations that were willing uh, to partner with us in this effort. And actually one of those partners uh, through uh, uh, recruiting commissioners, and those were the folks listening to these testimonies, was Nuela Cabral. Um, and she brought her students with her. And uh, through this partnership, they were actually able to create this uh, amazing video. These student uh, journalists were able to create an amazing video to kind of highlight uh, what was happening at the town hall. And that's actually what we want to share with you right now. Crenshaw, who is the executive director for the African American Policy Forum and who is also a professor of law at UCLA in Columbia. So, Kimberly, this is your first time holding a town hall event in Philadelphia. How does it feel? Oh, it's fantastic. I really was excited about being able to bring the town hall series here. This is the first town hall to come out of the second year, and I thought it was an amazing event. I was really delighted about the turnout. Um, very moved by the testimony. As one of the youngest testifiers here, you're only 16, how did that feel, like being one of the youngest ones and your story was so powerful? I've been the youngest in the room for um, a while now and usually I'm too scared to speak up just because I feel like um, other women have like more experiences than I do. Other women are more equipped to answer the questions that are presented to them. And so I feel like giving me the chance to testify uh, kind of brought my voice out in the space of women who are older than me. And Sheena, how did it feel to testify in front of everyone and tell your story? It felt liberating. It felt like it wasn't about me. It felt like it was about everybody that was here. So we're here with Lauren Fine with the Youth Sentencing and Reentry Project. What was your role today at the Breaking the Silence Town Hall for Girls of, for Women of Color? So today I served as a commissioner, um, which meant that I was the recipient of testimonies from young women who have experienced various things and they were sharing their experience. And my role was really just to listen, try to ask questions to help um, get out more of what they've experienced and also to respond and make commitments on behalf of different systems of what we can do about the things that they brought up in their testimonies. Unless you continue to tell your stories of trauma, we don't know what leads to you being arrested or the behaviors that cause you to act out. And all we see is a young person standing in front of us with an arrest. We had um, people talk about street harassment, about gender-based violence, about sexual assault, about school push-out and being labeled and being um, not supported in an educational environment because of different reasons, whether it's race, whether it's sexual identity. Once we remove that pride and be humble and say, that woman that's experiencing that trauma, she's me. I tell women, it's okay to tell your story. It gets real when you have to tell your story and accept your story. And it shed light that, guess what? You're not alone and you are just like everybody else. You know, you have a story to tell. I think the one thing that really struck me is something that we try to incorporate in our work is 
listen to the people who know best, um, the people who often are young um, and don't have a seat at the table but need to be given more of a seat at the table. We're starting to hear people talk about youth, not just men, not just boys. Girls and women are part of the conversation more than ever before. Um, in the movement against uh, police um, abuse, we're hearing people say, say her name. We're hearing the names of women and girls who've been killed by the police or abused by the police. to highlight the issues that are affecting girls of color specifically because those issues lead manifest to them becoming a woman of color and having those same issues in addition to the fact that girls have voices too So we pretty much wanted to show that video to just kind of like put into place and just discuss like things that can be done. You know, we talked about uplifting the voices of women and girls. We talk about bringing in different partners and just having a conversation and making sure that those who are being impacted the most are not only a face, but a voice at the table. Um, and this is just, it's not the end all be all. This is just like a starting point. Um, and we just really like to stress the fact that while we had that town hall, that the conversations and the stories that were shared, it can't just stay in that room. We have to make sure that we are taking next steps. We have to make sure that the policymakers and the community organizations and leaders that are in the room, like you made these commitments to do something better and make a difference. We're gonna make sure that we hold you accountable for those actions. And we just kind of wanted to take the time now um, to open up the floor um, just for any questions, comments, concerns, just any feedback, or just even kind of for us to have a discussion about what we're all individually doing back home to make sure that we're trying to make a better life and a better world for women and girls. We want to create those spaces. It's hard. Sorry. Um, we want to create those spaces, and it's very difficult um, to create those spaces. So I applaud you for being able to do that. But I'm at, I want to know how do you go about protecting the girls that you work with um, in terms of sharing their stories, um, and then making sure that once they share their stories, that it doesn't just sit there. Um, and that they are connected to all of those pieces around accountability that you were just mentioning. Um, so aside from Girls Justice League, I actually work for another organization where it's like very big for us to collect stories. Um, and I'm very big about protection. Um, I feel like when it comes to people that I meet, I like come into like mama bear mode, even though I don't have any children. Um, but just one, I guess, aside from being in an organization that I work with being a predominantly white organization, I feel like a lot of times they want to say, hey, like, let's collect stories. We need to like share with the world what's going on. And it's just like, okay, we can have these stories, but this is not for you to come in here to say, you know what, as a white woman, I'm going to give your story because at the end of the day, you can never relate to what they're saying. And they don't need for you to read their stories and be their voice. They can do it themselves. Um, so I make sure that when I'm in certain spaces that I am creating that space that is needed for young women or girls to feel empowered to share their own stories. And I feel like that's priority and they should be the ones telling their stories, not anyone else. Um, and I know when it came to this event that we had um, in Philadelphia, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were highlighting different issues that, you know, girls are experiencing in Philadelphia. And I will say it was kind of hard um, because, you know, while we all go through various things, it's kind of, it's a tough thing to share your story in front of so many people. And like, even in the work that I do, or we both do, like, I probably have various stories Stories, but at first I'm just like, dang, like I really don't want to share my story. Like, uh, I don't know, but I've definitely got more comfortable with it. Um, but I think it just comes to a point of making sure that as we recruit people to share their stories, they're in the process from beginning to end. And it's like 
also having them in like the development phase. So it's like, as we were planning this town hall, we are identifying individuals, but it's like, okay, well, this is what we're gonna do. How do you um, see yourself playing a role in this? You know, what part of your stories do you wanna share? Okay, we're having this town hall. So after this, we're gonna have a meeting to talk about, okay, what are we gonna do next? How are we gonna hold these individuals accountable? So I think it just really goes to say, like, we just need to make sure we're including people from like the, the beginning to the end, and just making sure that they're a central voice um, and their voice is being heard throughout the process. And I would just add one point to that. When recruiting uh, testifiers, one thing that we were very intentional about was making sure that they had, oops, sorry about that, um, making sure that they uh, had support services. So being intentional about are they already, um, do they have a social worker? Uh, because sometimes they don't, sometimes these girls have been pushed out. Uh, but also with that, making sure that when we are entering into these spaces of even preparing for the testimony, making sure that we're um, not only saying, all right, let's get started, but you know, roses and thorns, how are we doing today? Making sure that it's not just, oh, we need this, from you um, as another organization might do, but making sure that we're also building relationships in the process of working together. Thank you. Um, how do you find what do you find successful in garnering success and interest in addressing these types of issues in communities, especially like rural communities, where we may not even be having this conversation, we may not even be addressing the fact that violence against girls of color is happening and it's bad that it's happening, but it's more just something that's been happening and everyone's just been pushing it under the rug. How do you open up to even begin to draw girls in and garner interest in the community in addressing these types of issues? So we don't, uh, we didn't really have any experience with working with girls from rural communities, but I would definitely say one of the most important things in doing this work is collaboration, cross-sector collaboration. So for example, it wasn't just uh, Girls Justice League, it was Courageous, it was Planned Parenthood, it was uh, Philly Now. Um, and so through that, being able to um, Recruitment really was a group effort uh, because sometimes, you, you know, there we all work with girls and women of color, but you know, everyone has a different story, and also some folks aren't willing to not not willing but aren't ready to share their stories. So that was probably the most um, important strategy was collaboration because we all played different roles, and that really helped create a supportive environment. This one, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so I really feel like it kind of just depends on like where you are and just like the, the comfort levels. I will say when it comes to Girls Justice League, we start um, recruiting um, girls at the age of 13 um, to try to get them as early as we can. But obviously, if we can get them before 13, um, that would be ideal and would be best. Um, just But based off the work that we've been doing this far, it seems that it's been easier to recruit them starting like going into their freshman year of high school. However, as we expand, we do want to make it to where we can actually recruit middle school girls just for that reason that, you know, we understand that girls are experiencing things at earlier ages and we want to make sure that we can get to them as soon as we can to help mitigate any issues so that they can really be productive as they get older.